You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Over a hundred years ago, much of the world was in turmoil, with thousands of terrorized people fleeing from one place to another. Local wars, military conflicts, great poverty, economic hardships, political unrest, ethnic repression, starvation and death dominated life. A beacon of light amid this darkness and repression was the beleaguered United States of America. It was in this haven of hope that Eastern Orthodoxy continued to grow as the unshakable faith of love and peace for millions of people. The uh, immigration came about because of the nature and the culture of the country of Greece. They had just come out of a war, and of course they had been occupied for centuries by the Muslims, and this, this poverty of the nation just uh, drove them to America, and America was a place to come. The other thing is that when they came here, the massive migration, they would uh, get together, many of them from the same village or little area, and say, well, we'll build a church. So they came over with their, not just the political baggage, but a new mentality about this church is our church because we came from this village or these little villages here. So While little is known of the first Greeks to settle in Dallas, in 1961, Peter Zeres wrote a condensed history of the Hellenic community in Dallas. That in 1889, two of the earliest Greeks to arrive in Dallas were named John and Philippis. John was most likely Athos H. Yanu, who sold fruit downtown on the street opposite Sanger Brothers. Philippis was George Philippis from Macedonia. He sold candies on the street at Elm and Lamar opposite Commerce National Bank. The Greek community in Dallas came together and in 1915 chartered the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church. Well, I, I remember it distinctly. It was a wooden frame building that, that they built. I forgot how much they borrowed. It wasn't much and got it paid for and it served their purpose. And then as the community was growing and more people coming, they felt like they needed to to move to a big, bigger place, and uh, they found this site, what I remember, at Swiss and Apple, and it was centrally located. Well, yes, there's a, a, a big custom in the Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox Church, and everybody, when they're christened, they're christened, their name is from a saint. For example, mine's Saint Demetrius, and there was Saint Nicholas, and there was Saint George. And so these families, when it was a St. George Day, they had what they called uh, names day parties. And if there were half a dozen families that had a George in it, well, you'd go from house to house in the afternoon. They'd serve you a Greek pastry, a little drink. And then the last house you went to, they had a huge feast. And so it was a way of bringing the families together. And that was very, very popular. And all families followed that custom. So I think that was kind of the glue of keeping it as a family. Despite global unrest in the World War I era, the first church was successfully established on Rig Street, and Reverend Michael Montilas was hired as the first priest. This wood frame structure was intended only to be a temporary church because most of the Greeks in Dallas meant to eventually return to Greece. The Holy Trinity community was shepherded through part of the Roaring Twenties by Reverend Thaddeus Lekas. Then in 1929, like the rest of the country, the Greek community and Holy Trinity slid into a marked decline during the Great Depression, surviving on a meek existence. Became very resourceful because many of them, as I said, came from villages. They lived off the land. And they came here, it was just a natural thing to have gardens and to survive in that respect. So that was helpful in them to be able to live sort of native life with regards to food, clothing, and for instance, I'd wear hand-me-downs from two older brothers. That's sort of a typical pattern as far as surviving during the Great Depression. Each family, of course, had their own concerns and everything, but collectively we were really united in many respects so that any family that suffered, everybody had anything they could do to help us all to survive in some fashion or another. The change for the better came in 1930 when oil was discovered in East Texas. As the profiteers of oil production moved to Dallas, they brought a much needed boost to the local economy 
and Dallas began to prosper. Reverends Gerasimus Kalinikos, Dimitrios Papadimitriou, and Nikolaos Spiliotsis held Holy Trinity together through the 1930s. Reverend Theonisios Sakaleriou served during the worst years of the Depression and World War II. My mother, who died at 96, always said, America's my country, Greece is my heritage. And I think that's how they all felt. They came here and they learned to speak the language, they learned to vote, and they learned to work hard. And so I, I think that all of them had that deep feeling for the United States of America. We're proud of the fact that little piece of dirt of jagged mountains, not a flat place on earth in Greece, was, um, was pri our pride is that they held the Germans off for six months. Many of the European countries collapsed in an hour, surrendered to the motorcycles, bring the surrender terms and whatever. But we are very proud of our people that stood up. The other thing is, is that our people as an ethnic group bought more war bonds than any other group in the country. So we're proud of that aspect. That's how much we unabashedly embraced America. We believed in it. Dallas grew and prospered following World War II, and the Orthodox movement was growing rapidly across the nation in the 1950s, sparking the creation of the National Greek Orthodox Youth of America. The Hellenic Junior League in Dallas, previously started by Holy Trinity, was supplanted by Goya. Progress and excitement characterized the mood of the growing numbers of Orthodox people moving to Dallas. They expanded youth athletic programs, festivals, the Greek school, philoptokos, and general fundraising. Talent abounded among the young people of the Greek community. Reverend Peter Bethos led the expanding Greek community to higher levels of achievement in almost every endeavor. And on January 25, 1953, conducted the first wedding at the new church on Swiss Avenue, uniting Gus Vilios and Barbara Christa. I credit him with breaking down any of these differences and the, the start of gelling them together as a unit, if you will, and because uh, many of the little cells, if you will, informal circles would say, well, the priest belongs to our camp. He says, I belong to one camp, and I'm standing at him in church. So he, that was his main thing. We came to know him as a family. Uh, he married my oldest brother, and so it was brides from Cicero, Illinois, and uh, he baptized our children as well. So we had a connection with him in that respect, very close connection. But uh, that, uh, and I began, he got me started in helping him doing uh, baptisms and weddings. In the mid-1950s, fundraising for a variety of church projects was an ever-present concern. The most creative fundraiser sponsored by Holy Trinity was born during this time. A modest event called the Bazaar, organized chiefly by three women, Janie Cumperis Karras, Evelyn Tassos Simos, and Elaine Mastrogany Stratton started in 1957. The annual Greek Food Festival became the first and now oldest such event of its kind in Texas. Here again, it's, it's dangerous to mention names because if you leave somebody out, you know, it's not good. So I'm not gonna mention names, but there were a few women that got together and just decided to do pastries. And so each one would make their specialty and take them to church and sell them. So that's how it started. It started as a pastry, and then word got out. And back then, um, you got to be careful. Bigger's not better. <laughs> and so it was small back then. And these women, I mean, they had their heart and soul, and they made everything with real pecans, real butter. Everything was the top notch. And that's, what, that's why we got the reputation we did for the festival. And it kept building, and they decided to add a little food. And, then entertainment, it just kept growing off. But it all started with some women doing pastries. Greek pride reached a new height in November 1957 with the performance of Maria Callas at the inauguration of the Dallas Civic Opera Company at the State Fair Music Hall. Indeed, a historic event in the cultural life of Dallas. The world was changing rapidly in the 1960s. Holy Trinity became an anchor of stability in this sea of confusion and also came to the attention of the National Greek Orthodox community Evelyn Simos served as the National Grand President for the Daughters of Penelope in 1961 and 1962. Holy Trinity celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1965. 
Chris Victor Simos was the first person of Greek descent to be elected to the Texas State House of Representatives in 1966, putting the spotlight on the Greek Orthodox Church in Texas. Well, I think we started seeing uh, a change because everything was, as I say sometimes, Greek Greek. And I think we saw an influx of Americanizing a little bit. We're still the Greek Orthodox Church, but we also saw a change as kids came into the world. Uh, maybe they didn't know the Greek culture as well. They didn't speak the language, the Greek language. So you saw more and more of a transition starting to get, adapt a lot of the things in America. Uh, the 50th anniversary was a, a mark of, of a major step for us that we were able to make the progress that we did to be where we are and to still be together. The simplicity, that's about what I recall that we had better relations, if you will. There was an article as I was going through stuff this past week that I found it was written about Mr. Tom Simos and how he came over from the village and how he started a restaurant and how he, he had a tough time, he made it, and that he had helped during the Depression and other times. He was one that would go to a bank and borrow money. He had a, over a, he had co-signed over a hundred notes to pull people through. Reverend Bethus's strong leadership of the Holy Trinity community into the 1970s resulted in an increase of membership, participation in church events, and brought on the era of volunteerism and stewardship. Church leaders began planning for the future, searching for a larger and more convenient location for those members who had begun moving northward. Then on June 6, 1978, the parish was devastated at the sudden loss of their beloved Reverend Bethos, who had just celebrated his 25th year at Holy Trinity. In 1978, Reverend Nicholas Katinas came to Dallas as the new presiding priest of Holy Trinity. As Dallas and Holy Trinity experienced continued growth, an assistant priest was required to help minister to parishioners. Holy Trinity's first assistant priest, Reverend Christopher Constantinides, arrived in Dallas in 1979 and later returned to become Holy Trinity's presiding priest. Well, Father Bithus was uh... Uh, really a, a wonderful man and he did he took a, a parish that was transitional for er, early years of parishes they transition from priest to priest and people to people and committees to committees and they're trying to find kind of where they where they fit and Father Bithus was probably the glue that brought all of that together during well he was here in the 50s and in the 60s and then into the 70s when, and until he passed away and he did a lot of bringing that up bringing the parish together and building the parish and it was getting uh, quite large, so he had done a wonderful job of, of bringing them all together to find their purpose and, and to bring Greek Orthodoxy to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. When I was called to come down here, my, really, my, my main focus in my job was to work with the youth and to get them organized and to help them bring them closer to their church, help them understand that church can be church and church, but church can be fun. And, and that's really what we did. And I was here for approximately four years. Uh, working primarily with with the youth and, and growing the youth uh, um, organizations and, and making them strong and making them realize that that what you do now is going to you know help you later on in your life with church and many of those young people uh, you know have obviously stayed within the church and have taken leadership roles in the church. By the 1980s the Dallas business picture had changed. Most of the oil industry had shifted to Houston However, a new technology boom brought prosperity to Dallas through the growing telecom and computer industries, and Dallas maintained its status as a banking center. The 1980s also marked another shift in demographics for Holy Trinity. Most of the newcomers settled in North Dallas and Far North Dallas. After consideration of a parcel of land on Forest Lane, the parish decided to purchase a plot of land in Richardson, between Greenville and Abrams, across from the Restland Cemetery. The parcel became known as the St. Barbara Chapel property and was dedicated on August 22, 1982 in honor of the St. Barbara Philoptopos Society chapter. In the fall of 1982, Neiman Marcus allocated one week of their annual fortnight to Greek art and culture. Anthony Quinn and Irene Pappas, stars of Zorba the Greek, along with many parishioners and dignitaries, including the ambassador of Greece, attended the gala event. You know, I remember going to my first food, Greek food festival and seeing all ages there from the 80, 90 year old men 
really serving uh, the community by, they, were, uh, they would raise basil to plant in the olive trees and they were selling them. There, there was a booth off the side of the hall and there was uh, Mr. Xeris and Mr. Kristen and a couple others. And, and they were as much as involved as the young kids that were dancing and the moms. And, and really the dedication of a lot of the, the, the moms at that festival, the Helen Triopolis of the world. And Jimmy said, didn't mention names, but there were some real characters. The Mayor, Maria Helenopoulos who's passed away. These ladies were pillars that worked every year, worked for decades and, uh, and kept that tradition. And it was easy to, to simulate and pick that up. And that's what you try to do as you can get involved for the next generation and next generation can continue this. Due to the demands of the burgeoning food festival, the Clergy Laity Congress of 1986, and the increased administrative workload in the mid-1980s, it was necessary to hire a full-time administrator. Bill Carahall served from 1985 through 2001. By the end of 1980, the food festival had become a hallmark of the Dallas fall calendar, growing in scope and impact to a four-day event. Premier Night was initiated in 1980, and together with the expansion of the festival, Holy Trinity was able to project the positive aspects of its heritage to the Dallas community at large. Progress and growth as a faith-based community in the expanding city of Dallas meant for exciting changes in the 1990s. By the last decade of the 20th century, Dallas attracted many newcomers and businesses. Among the employees arriving with the economic progress were Greek Orthodox seeking a parish to join. Holy Trinity provided the new home they sought. These newcomers also settled far north of Swiss Avenue and Apple, and their numbers strained the existing space of the church. Once again, Holy Trinity was outgrowing its facilities, and planning for the future was in order. We had outgrown the church downtown, that's for sure. And most of the people, this has been a time kind of like Dallas still is, where there's lots of unemployment and not enough people, so companies were transferring a lot of people in here. And it was mostly to the north. So what we discovered was that there were a lot of families like, say, Farmers Branch, Carrollton, Plano, Richardson, that we weren't drawing downtown. And so the decision was made that if we were going to go with just one Greek Orthodox church in the Dallas area, then we needed to move north. And it was a tough decision. And the people who lived in the East Dallas area, of which Frank's family was one, uh, really didn't want to move. They said, let's just have two churches. Well, we tried that for a little while with St. Barbara's and it, it just didn't work. But the community was being split. What was happening is we had people going to church up north and then some family members would come to church at Swiss and Haskell. So you literally, you had a mother with, with maybe a certain age child here and, a, and a son, the father taking the other age child to the other church. And I saw our community splitting. So when we got this proposal from the Theological Seminary discussion, being again our talents in the business, we start to, okay, what can we do? And as an alternative was, let's find the third piece of property, which was this location, to come here. During this time, there was a great effort by the leaders of the church to serve both the Swiss Avenue parishioners and those who attended the St. Barbara Chapel. A chain of events took place in June of 1990 that set in motion the purchase of the property at Alpha and Hillcrest. This was the beginning of the new journey of Holy Trinity. As the 20th century came to an end, the parishioners of the new Holy Trinity Church were set to begin the new millennium. When you look back, all that was divine intervention. When I talked about earlier about our talents, and we all have talents, if we don't, God makes us use these talents, and it's because we had done real estate. I had just done another reclamation of a floodplain property and able to see what this property could be. And then, so we go to General Assembly, we get approved to, to come here. Again, divine intervention steps in when we needed about 250,000 cubic yards of dirt to fill this property to get it out of the floodplain. That Monday, Central Expressway starts construction. We get 250,000 square feet of dirt free, delivered to our property, installed, put the specs, engineered specs, so we can get our property. That was a half a million dollar gift back then. One of my favorite memories of Father Bithis was after he passed away. And there's a story goes when we, when we found this property and we were moving here at the corner of Hillcrest and Alpha, uh, one of the parishioners in our, uh, in our uh, congregation came up to me 
uh, John Alex Edrich, who's passed away too, and he used to live at the corner of Coit and Alpha in that intersection. And his George, his son, who was a dentist at the, at the corner of Preston and Alpha. And after we moved, and it was like we we're under construction, we're here for the groundbreaking, John Alex Edrich comes up to me, he goes, you know, I need to tell you a story. And with his Greek, broken Greek action, he was a painter. You know, Father Bethes told me many years ago when I was at the dentist, George Bethes, he goes, between my son's office and your house, there's a piece of property at Hillcrest and Alpha. That's where our church should go. And this is probably, he told him this in the 70s. And here's Father Bethes, who's passed away. Now John's passed away. He had a premonition that we should be at this location. And to me, that was an amazing story. The foresight also that Father Beth has had. He saw where the community was going. And, and that was probably one of my favorite Father Beth stories. The dawn of the new millennium found Holy Trinity preparing for the consecration of its new church at Hillcrest in Alpha. On the weekend of December 7, 2001, the parish participated in the solemn yet joyous ceremony. Holy Trinity continued the long tradition of leadership and enlightenment in the Greek community and the parish became known as the proponent of the best of Greek culture. A parishioner participated in the Olympics in 2004. In 2006, Reverend Christopher Constantinides, who was the first assistant priest at Holy Trinity, returned to become the presiding priest. In 2008, Holy Trinity began delivering to the community its spiritual message through the internet via its website and podcasts. I've always believed that God kind of directs our path. We don't always know the reason, we don't always know the why, or we don't always know the how come. But in any event, we returned in 2006 in order to, um, again, take over, take over the, the wonderful reigns of all the, the clergy that were here before us and to grow the church and to allow it to continue on into the, into the next millennium and to, and to bring our, you know, keep our youth with the church and to keep the people um, together, not to allow them to scatter and to allow the church to, to progress. So it was kind of interesting. It was kind of, uh, you know, because when I came back, you know, obviously there were a lot of new, new people here at the church. I had no, I had known a handful of these people that were here from before, but it, it was a little uh, interesting and a little different, but it was a, a wonderful, a wonderful time. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had a, a wonderful 10 years now here in Dallas. The annual Greek Food Festival, with its tours and exposure to orthodoxy, has become a new avenue of evangelism. The people of the Dallas Metroplex flock to the festival, mainly for Greek culinary delights, but many find the church tours illuminating. You know, a lot of these beautiful icons are paid for by that, and there are no bills paid out of festival money, believe me. It's, it all goes into new things and new additions, and we're desperately out of classroom space. We're gonna to have to add more classrooms. So it's a good problem, but it's a difficult problem to try to solve as well. But there are still a lot of new families coming in, and I would say at least 80%, 80 to 85% of the new families coming in are all young people with children. And we're gradually moving totally away from the Greek language for the simple reason that we're having a lot of uh, interfaith marriages now. And, you know, we want to retain people. We don't want to lose people. As the Holy Trinity Centennial Year began, a year-long series of celebrations were planned in honor of the 100-year anniversary of the parish. Does a person who's 100 years old, it, it, it's amazing to be 100 years old. For a church to, to celebrate that 100 years, it really, it really um, celebrates all of the, the struggle, the blood, the sweat, the tears that the, these parish work to get here, but it also celebrates the, the wonderful accomplishments that have happened. Now this, this little church that started with 10, 15 families, these, I call them the pioneering fathers who came from Greece, is now over a thousand families here and uh, it is just doing wonders here for the, for the community, for the Dallas community here and, and the faith of the Greek Orthodox Church. And so I, I really do see the growth of the Orthodox Church um, taking, taking off here. I have to thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's absolutely enjoyable and it's absolutely something that really opens the views for a future as a community. Greek Orthodox community, you are carers 
of a superb culture and civilization which gave democracy, human rights, arts, philosophy, science in the world. And since you also represent orthodoxy, which is in a continuous line with the very foundation of Christianity, we expect you, your community, to help assisting in the problems, the crisis, the difficulties that we face as America. Let us celebrate not simply 100 years here, we celebrate 7,000 years on Earth as a cultural entity. Today, the Greek community of Dallas stands ready to face whatever challenges tomorrow has in store. It is the parishioner's faith of the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church that will persevere well beyond the next hundred years.